Okay, we're, uh, the purpose of today is to finish um, the uh, what we call Unit 7, D-Mics versus Digital Noise Reduction. D-Mics versus Digital Noise Reduction, it is the one that we uh, finished with, uh, or that we, we did the, the second half of last week, we started into this particular topic, so today we're going to wind it up. Okay, so I'll share screen, and we'll go to take a peek at the... Uh, <clears throat> at the notes that we've got and for this particular session last time we followed the powerpoints a lot more today we'll follow the notes a bit more and we'll start right at the top but because uh, last week I kind of talked in general about directional mics and talked about hair cells and increasing signal to noise ratio and how people how loud people talk in soft environments and how loud people talk in average environments and as the noise increases, speech loudness also increases, but it doesn't increase quite at the same pace. We talked about signal-to-noise ratio last week and how the signal-to-noise ratio gets actually worse and worse as the noise increases. All kinds of stuff like that. And so today, when you look at the top of the notes here, I really ingrain and put a star by this fact, the fact that hearing aids need to do two things. Number one is the duh principle. I mean, they have to provide gain for the hearing loss, okay? Uh, obviously, increase audibility. And when you're talking increasing gain for audibility, that is a compression issue. That's essentially what we covered before the midterm. That's all. Are you applying linear gain? Are you applying WDRC, output limiting compression, blah, blah, blah. Now the second goal, increasing signal to noise ratio. And that's the domain of the second half of this course, namely digital noise reduction, which doesn't increase the signal to noise ratio, makes you feel better. And the second way is directional microphones, which actually do increase the signal to noise ratio. And we said last week that digital noise reduction could be considered the heart, D mics could be considered the head, digital noise reduction could be considered the art, directional mics could be considered the science. They both work together as a team. So as we read here, digital noise reduction does not objectively improves speech recognition and noise. It subjectively enhances listening comfort in noise. And it says here, D-mics do increase, do indeed increase the signal to noise ratio. Let's make sure we understand signal to noise ratio really well, okay? And that's gonna be seen here in our slide. I'll pull this up in one particular slide here. When you are looking at this particular slide here, right there, pull this puppy up right here. There you go. And when that little black bar on the top decides to go away. Anyway, for those with normal hearing, speech and noise, if they are of similar intensity, you have a zero dB signal to noise ratio. If the speech is 60 and the noise is 60, they are the same. You have a zero dB SNR. A normal hearing person will understand half of the speech in that situation. If you make the signal to noise ratio plus five, in other words, if the noise is 60 and the speech is 65, you've got a plus five signal to noise ratio. You're laughing. You're gonna get all the, all the words. Okay, so this basically, that's the general rub of it. When you're now looking at mild to moderate sensory neural loss, okay, the most common hearing loss in the world, they require an additional 5 dB. So in other words, if the noise is 60 and the speech is 65, then they are going to get 50% of the words said. Whereas for normal hearing, it was when they were even Stephen. Okay, so they, when they have a plus 5 dB signal to noise ratio, they get half of what's said. So they need an extra 5, so that you, now you'll have a plus 10 signal to noise ratio, and then they'll get it all. Okay, so essentially that's why the target of directional mics is to improve the signal to noise ratio by about 5. That's the best that a D mic will ever be able to do. 
on a hearing aid, okay? Directional microphones, picking up sound in the direction you're facing. It's going to maximally increase your signal-to-noise ratio by about 5 dB. But you know what? In real life, it ain't going to be quite that purdy, okay? In real life, it'll be more like 2 to 3 dB. And that's because real life is not a nice, tight lab situation. So now back to our notes here. What do we got? Directional mics, there's, there's nothing digital about them. So if you see a true-false question, you know, on, a, on an exam, directional microphones are now digital. and No, they're not. They're just transducers. They just change sound into electricity, just like they did on analog hearing aids. And there's nothing digital about your receiver on the other end either. It's a, just a transducer. just changes electricity back into sound. That's all. Directional mics, we said, have been around for years and years and years. I think they were actually invented by the U.S. military after World War II. I mean, they've been around for years. Anyway, Killian, Mead Killian, the inventor of the K-Amp, said that the older directional mics on hearing aids didn't work very well at all. He said cupping one's hand behind your ear worked better than some of these. This is kind of funny. If you've been all been reading my chapter in, in the book, in, in my uh, textbook, Compression for Clinicians, look for this little experiment by Bentler. I think it's on page 47, but I'm not sure if that's the, in, 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 the, in the recent edition. But just uh, but, uh, look up uh, that name in the index of your book, and you'll see a little experiment that they did. They compared <laughs> two digital hearing aids. Get this. They compared two digital hearing aids with an old ear trumpet, with an ear trumpet from 100 years ago. All of them came up even Stephen. In other words, there was no statistical difference in the way that they handled amplification of speech in noise. Now, isn't that a trip? I think that's hilarious. Each was equal for listening to speech and noise. Anyway, the purpose of directional mics is to improve the signal to noise ratio, to favor the pickup of sounds from the front compared to sounds from behind. So now, if you've got a directional mic, and this may be a true false question, you know, like, hey, Directional mics are more sensitive to sounds from the front. True or false? And the answer, of course, would be false. They're not. They're just, they're equally sensitive to sounds from the front as regular mics are. They're just less sensitive to sounds coming from the rear. And when you look at what's called a polar plot, you'll see that. So let's go and look at a polar plot just to show what we mean. Here's a polar plot. And take a look at directional mics versus omnidirectional microphones right here. The big blue circle would be an omnidirectional microphone. Pretend the zero at the top is the person's nose, the 180 at the back is the rear of a person's head, and the 270 and the 90 are the person's ears. Okay, so this person's facing the front. A regular omnidirectional microphone, in other words, a microphone that's not directional, will be equally sensitive to sounds from all directions. You can see the tracing of my cursor here. So that's the blue circle on the outside. But now when you're looking toward the front, now look at the three other lines, the red, the black, and the green. They all touch the front too. Those are three different directional mics. And notice that they're equally sensitive to sounds from the front. It's just that the directional microphones are less sensitive to sounds from the rear. That's all. That's how. That's why they are directional. And look at this polar plot closely here. Look at where these lines pinch. All of a sudden, they're at my, they, they pinch at minus 30. That means that these directional microphones are, get this, 30 decibels less sensitive, okay? Right at the points where they pinch, right in the center there. That means they are 30 decibels less sensitive than regular mics, okay? But that's only from that direction. So look at the red heart. The red heart is called a cardioid directional microphone. Cardioid, like your heart. It's, it's because its pickup pattern is shaped like a heart. An upside down one, but nonetheless. So look at it from sounds from the rear. It's 180 degrees. Look at that. 
it's 30 decibels less sensitive than a regular omnidirectional mic is to sounds coming from this particular direction. But as soon as you change directions, okay, that 30 turns into 20, and that 20 turns into 10, and that 10 turns into five, you're following me, and that turns into about two and a half, and that turns into nothing. Okay, so if you've got 360 degrees, let's find the distance between the blue and the red, blue and the red, blue and the red, 360 times. And you find out that decibel distance or that def decibel difference for each degree of 360 degrees. You add them all up and divide by 360, and you'll get yourself an average of about 5-ish, 5 dB. Okay, so overall, the directional mic is about 5 dB less sensitive to sounds from other directions. Overall. So I'll say that again, okay? Make sure we understand that because this is on the final. Promise. Look at the difference between the directional mic and the omnidirectional mic. And you'll see the decibel distance or the difference in sensitivity. So the D mic is 30 decibels less sensitive than the omnidirectional mic, but only to sounds coming from dead behind. If from other directions, that sensitivity difference diminishes. So that 30 turns into 20, look where my cursor is, turns into 10 already at this direction, turns into about five here, turns into about two and a half, and then turns into none. So finding the difference between the red and the blue line 360 times, add up those differences, and then divide by 360, you'll get your average. So on average, your cardioid directional mic is about 5 dB less sensitive to sounds from other directions than the omnidirectional mic is. Done. Now let's look at the black one. The black one's called supercardioid. Not cardioid, now it's called supercardioid. Okay, now look at it. How is it different? Well, it's a little bit less sensitive to sounds from the sides, but look at this, it's got this bubble in the back. <laughs> so when they're making it less sensitive to sounds from the sides, you've got this bulging little bubble in the back. Oh, well, do the same thing, okay? Now look at the pinch points of the black. It's got one null here, and look at, it's got another null here. These nulls where, they, where, it, where it touches minus 30. What are these polar plots? They're sensitivity patterns. That's all they are. They're just talking about how sensitive is the mic to sounds from all directions. So you've got two pinch points in the black one. You only had one pinch point in the red, okay? So you've got a pinch point here and a pinch point there. So only at those two pinch points, those are called nulls, N-U-L-L-S, nulls. Only at those two nulls is this directional microphone 30 decibels less sensitive than the directional mic. But do the same game. Find the, death, the difference between the blue and the black, blue and the black, blue and the black. Do that difference 360 times. Add up all those differences, divide by 360, you'll come up with another number that's about five. Same, okay? Then you can take your hypercardioid. It's the green. And the hypercardioid is even less sensitive to sounds from the side than the other mics are, but its bubble in the back is a little bit bigger. So it loses some of its effectiveness behind. So they all trade off. Once again, if you find the difference between the blue and the green, blue and the green, blue and the green, and do that 360 times, add them all up, divide by 360, you'll get another number about five. Okay? So these are just different polar plots. You might want one, let's say if you were a taxi driver, and your, your client was sitting behind you. You might want a polar plot that's shaped like a figure eight. I want to pick up sounds from the front, and I want my bubble to be in the back because I want to hear the guy talking in the back. You know, so hearing aids change 
polar plots. They literally, digital hearing aids, what is digital about the mics is that they can change polar plots. And some of it do it in different programs. You can manually choose a listening and noise program, a listening and quiet program. Then again, some directional mics adapt. So they'll change automatically so you don't even have to do the change, okay? But polar plots are just drawings of the microphone sensitivity patterns. They're all showing directional mics compared to the blue, which is a non-directional, omni-directional mic. Okay, back to the notes. Here we go. All right, purpose of D mics is to pick up the signal to noise ratio to improve it, to favor the pickup of sounds from the front compared to sounds behind. Of course, put a star by this one here. If the speech and noise both come from the front, well, then you're screwed because a directional mic isn't going to be of any help at all. They are of biggest help if the following assumption is met. Namely, you're listening to sound, your sound of interest is coming from the front, and the background noise is coming from other directions. Okay, that's when a D mic may be of some help. And it's important to mention here, too, that every stinking decibel that you can squeeze out, every dB that you can improve the signal-to-noise ratio by, that will have a dramatic effect on speech recognition. Killian always liked to say, <clears throat> and I believe this is what he said, he said every decibel that you improve speech recognition, well, that'll give you, that'll give you about, oh, um, uh, a, a whole, <clears throat> about 10% speech improvement. Every decibel that you can improve speech, <clears throat> excuse me, the signal to noise ratio will improve your speech recognition by about, <clears throat> here, have a peek. For mild to moderate loss, we showed the slide earlier. The magic number is about five. Recall, they need an extra five dB, okay? And Killian would say each additional dB SNR that you can do results in up to 10% speech improvement. Well, I think he was exaggerating. Let's just cut the number down to five. Let's say each additional decibel signal-to-noise ratio gives you a 5% improvement. Still. If you can improve the signal to noise ratio by 2 dB, that's a 10% improvement in speech recognition. That's not too shabby. If you can improve the SNR by 3 dB, well, that's a 15% improvement in speech recognition. That's not bad either. You know, so really kind of take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. It's, now he, he also, they also did a bit of research here, and this is important for you and I to know, okay? Your Parent Teachers Association, your PTA, Pure Tone Average, okay, as your hearing loss gets worse, you require a greater and greater SNR to improve your speech, okay? So by the time you are past the 50, if your hearing loss is moderately severe, if you are in the 70, 80 dB range, D mics are not going to be of all that great a help anymore. In other words, it's now time to start thinking other than D mics. What you're going to want to do then is what a lot of hearing aid manufacturers supply, a remote mic that the, list, that the person across the table can wear. And that person clips the mic onto his or her lapel, and the, your speech goes right into that mic, and that mic sends the, uh, by Bluetooth, to the person's hearing aids. So that person is increasing the signal to noise ratio, but you're not doing it with a directional mic. You're doing it with a remote lapel mic worn on the speaker. So the teacher might wear that mic. The person across the table at a restaurant may wear that mic. Okay, that's a different kettle of fish. Think of a poor, of a D mic as a poor man's FM system. FM systems are used in classrooms, of course, to increase the signal-to-noise ratio for kids in the classroom. Well, lots of hearing aid companies today, they don't resort to FM systems, but they resort to selling you a little remote lapel mic, and that comes with the package of your hearing aids. You'll get your pair of hearing aids, your RIC hearing aids, your receiver in canal hearing aids, 
this little guy that I'm showing you here, okay, some receiver and canal hearing aids, a pair of them will come with a bundled package. Oh, do you want a, a television device? And that's a little thing you can clip behind your TV that will send by Bluetooth to your hearing aids. So the listeners in the room can keep the TV at a normal volume and you wearing the hearing aids are getting the streaming. You're streaming into your hearing aids. So you'll get a TV device. You might get a device to work with your telephone. You might get a, a remote microphone device that we just talked about. Often hearing aid companies like Resound, they'll just sell it as a bundle of three. They'll come with your hearing aids. But this is just giving you basically an idea as to what's What's the general scene out there that way? But let's go and take a peek again at our notes. D. Mike's experienced, I would put a star by this one too. It's interesting. D. Mike's experienced a real renaissance, a rebirth in 1998. That was the year after digital hearing aids came out. The first digital hearing aids appeared in 1997, and they had digital noise reduction. And I'll tell you, all the competition in manufacturers of hearing aids that did not have digital hearing aids wept bitterly. I used to work for Unitron. You know what the sound of engineers crying sounds like? It's very tinny. There's a lot of uh, oil needed, okay, with their little pens in their pockets. And anyway, they freaked. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh boy, we're gonna, we don't have digital noise reduction. Oh my God. Well, guess what? Digital noise reduction was found not to work. Made you feel better, but it didn't increase speech and noise performance. It threw the baby out with the bathwater, recall from pre previous weeks. That's why D mics came back. And they came back into the picture big time. So they came back in 1998, and they were first put on ITEs. In the States, your Surgeon General, Food and Drug Administration, his name was Everett Koop, he put a real ban on false hearing aid advertising. Because a lot of hearing aid companies were advertising, oh, we're improving speech and noise performance. No, you're not. <laughs> And the only company that could claim it was Phonak because they had a really good directional mic called Audio Zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Up oh, Mazda. Anyway, so that's this little puppy right there. All right. So FDA finally laxed, put things in a little bit. They, they relaxed a little bit. But basically, Cheaper directional microphones basically consisted of one mic with two doors. More expensive ones consist of a mic with or two separate mics side by side. And we'll look at our PowerPoint and do that little, uh, um, what do you call, animation thing once again. Okay, looking at omnidirectional microphones here. You have a port or a doorway for sound to come in. And the diaphragm moves, that changes sound into electricity. A D mic has two separate doors, okay? One in the back, one in the front. So how do they work? When sound hits a diaphragm in one direction, you've got movement. But if sound hits the diaphragm equally from opposite directions, you've got cancellation. So in any mic, sound moves a diaphragm. Sound hitting both sides cancel each other out. So a D mic, here's the front, here's the rear. Sounds coming in are going to move the diaphragm, and everything's fine. When you're looking at sounds coming from the front, let's look at how it works. Sound coming in, moves the diaphragm, and carries on. Now I'll talk about sound coming from the rear. Here's a filter, something slowing down the passage of sound. So sound gets impeded or slowed down here, and yet sound carries around and enters the front port and they meet, and you've got cancellation. So let's look at this in animation form. Sound from behind, moving in, the sound from the rear is slowed down, meanwhile sound wraps around and they meet and there's cancellation. That is basically the technology behind how D mics work. This is just a white slide showing you the steps of sounds from the front, and this is the same thing showing you slides 
sounds from behind, just to basically what we showed. Okay, many directional microphones tend to cut off the low frequencies a little bit because the low frequencies are longer waves and those are the ones that wrap around more. But basically, here's your polar plots. This is an important picture to understand because it's basically showing you the pickup sensitivity pattern of a directional mic. All right, so we've covered now how directional mics generally work. That's what we covered just a few minutes ago. Move on down. Here's your polar plots. Okay. Now, there's a part in here that I don't really care about if people know this or not. But here is you want to read it. Okay. Sensitivity pattern of the mic. There have been cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid. Note how the dBs are reduced by 30 at the very center of the plot. These are at its nulls. That's what I was talking about early. But they don't re reduce all the sounds by 30 dB on average because, as I said, if you calculate the difference all the way around and then divide by 360, you'll come up with a number closer to 5. So the directional index, that is the number that quantifies the polar plot as a whole, the DI. Okay, directional index. You figured out the difference between the blue and the red, blue and the red, blue and the red, added them all up, divided by 360, you got your average number. That's your directional index, DI. Some people took into consideration the articulation index. Let's look at what that means. So here's your quantifying polar plots. DI, overall. Ratio of sensitivity to, to the front compared to surrounding sounds. The front sensitivity compared to surrounding sounds. Omnidirectional mics don't favor front sound, so they'll have a directional index of diddly. Okay, hearing aid directional mics try to achieve an average overall directional index of about five. That's what we've been talking about. Now, here's the slide that brings in the articulation index. And it says, hey, you can have a great directional index for 125 hertz, but 125 hertz is a low frequency. There's not much speech information. Speech information is the bottom line. So they'll say it's most important to have a good directional index for speech frequencies. Because you're going to note here, when you look at a polar plot, frequency is not on here, is it? It's just overall sensitivity, but it doesn't count frequency. Is this 1,000 hertz? Is it 2,000 hertz? Is it 4,000 hertz? It really hurts. What frequencies are we talking about? Well, you're going to want to have a decent polar plot sensitivity pattern for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. Okay, five, one, two, and four. You're going to want to have a decent polar plot sensitivity pattern for those four frequencies. So some people have gone into all this detail saying, oh, look at this. You've got your speech banana. And look at the speech banana here. Look at how it has 100 dots. 100 dots, exactly. I'll pull it closer. So now you're looking at that banana. Where are most of the dots clustered? They're right clustered around 2,000 hertz. That's where the biggest density of them is. What does each dot mean? Each dot represents 1% of the audible cues necessary to understand the speech. So you can see that there's very few dots around 250 because that's not much speech information. That's all vowels. And you've got five vowels, and every word shares a vowel, so vowels don't tell you much. Really, it's the high-pitched consonants. It's especially one, two, and four. 500 to a lesser degree, and 1,000, and then 2,000 is the max. So some people tried to give a real overall articulation index weighting to their directional mics. So they tried to look at this slide to give most clout to your polar plot at 2,000 hertz, okay? And it's kind of like, yeah, and then a little bit less clout to your polar plots at other frequencies. You can do that if you want, but you know what? Basically, look at this slide. If you give 25% to each of them, 
and you add up what your whole what your decibels and differences are. Here it's 4.3. Here it's 4.3. You know what? A man on a flying horse isn't going to recognize the difference. So when people start freaking out about, oh, 2,000 hertz is the most important, so you got to lend most weight to its polar plot. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, fine. Basically, take the message home. You want to have good directionality for five, one, two, and four thousand hertz. Overall, done. In general. DI's directional indices, directional indexes, are used to predict the signal-to-noise ratio improvement for speech that might be provided by a specific directional mic. Okay? Essentially. And when you read in my textbook, the second last chapter of the book, chapter 9, have a good read of that text, of that chapter, because that's covering today's topic. It covers last week's topic and today's topic. Digital noise reduction is covered in chapter 8. It's covered, you know, it's all direct digital features. Compression and digital hearing aids, directionality, I, mean, I should call it digital noise reduction and digital hearing aids, feedback reduction, expansion, all the stuff we covered a couple of weeks ago. And then chapter nine is covering benefits of directional mics versus digital noise reduction. Essentially, putting it all together. Don't worry about this articulation index. It's again, that's that stuff that they're trying to give all this different weight, you know, to to these two thousand hertz. That that's what they call the AI DI, and they try to weight or give different clout of importance to the different frequencies for regarding the polar plots. Freak thou not out. Teddy doesn't care. But essentially, they're saying, yeah, if you've got a four dB improvement. A four decibel signal to noise ratio improvement. Oh, four times 10 is 40% improvement. Well, remember, we said to cut that in half. So if you have a four dB improvement in signal to noise ratio, so, so you have a 20%, four times 5% is 20. So you have a 20% better speech scores. Good. Nothing wrong with that anyway. 40 is exaggerating. Automatic directionality means that you don't have to change the hearing aid from directional to regular. And when would you want regular? You probably would want regular, omnidirectional, in quiet. You want to be able to hear the birds. You want to be able to hear, you know, whatever, the toaster popping up. You know, the, whatever. You know, you're in fairly quiet situations. You're maybe speaking one-on-one. -on -one. There's no background noise. So you want your hearing aid microphones to pick up sounds from all directions, omnidirectional. When are you going to want directional? Probably in program two. When you switch to program two, what happens? You're increasing your gain for highs. You're decreasing your gain for lows. So your frequency response just went like a teeter-totter. Less gain for the vowels, more gain for the high frequency consonants, and probably directionality and digital noise reduction. So all of a sudden, program two is going to utilize a, a cluster of features, different frequency response, directionality to focus on the front, perhaps digital noise reduction to kick in. So <clears throat> it's when you switch programs. Now, sometimes people choose to have automatic directionality. Automatic directionality means you're not switching programs. Guess what? A lot of people can't handle it. A lot of elderly people, they don't want the complexity of changing the programs in their hearing aids. Even with their remote control, they're not into it. Believe me, as a clinician, I've seen it a thousand times. What you're going to have is you're going to have the person coming into the clinic saying, I don't know what all these things are for. They'll come in with a cluster of things and it's going to look like, like you're carrying, you know, like, I don't know what all this stuff is for. I got this thing and I got that and I got this device. I can't remember what these things are all for. What do I do with that stuff? And it's kind of like, well, that was your handheld control, your remote control to change the volume. And this, this button here changes your programs. And people want set and forget. 
They want to put the hearing aids in and let things handle themselves. You as a clinician can opt to let the software do this. And then this, what you're going to have is automatic directionality. And that just means the digital algorithm in the hearing aid makes the statistical decision as to whether you're going to have what's going on. Okay, depending on the listening situation. So if it's noisy, the hearing aid's automatically going to go into program two. It's automatically going to choose directionality. And it supposedly frees the listener from toggling a switch or making the decision. It allows set and forget. But it's not necessarily statistically better than manually changing things. It's meant to take the load off of the decision making by the client. There's a second thing you need to know here, and that's adaptive directionality. Now, adaptive directionality doesn't mean turning the directional on and off anymore. That's, it's different. It's changing the polar plots. So now the directional microphone will not only turn on and off automatically, but the polar plots will change automatically. Sometimes they'll be cardioid. Sometimes they'll be super cardioid. Maybe they'll look like that figure eight for the taxi driver. God knows, you know, that's just that they can switch among various polar plots depending on the listening situation. And it can shift the polar plot nulls where it's 30 dB less sensitive, it can shift those nulls so that those nulls face the origin of the noise. So if we go to that slide here and you look at this guy, whoops, okay, it can, it'll turn, whether you're using cardioid or super cardioid, <clears throat> it'll change the direction of these nulls. It'll turn things so that you are maximizing your signal to noise ratio. You're really trying to make the directional mic behave with a brain. So there's two words here, automatic directionality, <clears throat> adaptive directionality. Again, not statistically better, but again, it just supposedly is another bell and a whistle on hearing aids. Resound as a hearing aid company has an interesting asymmetrical D mic fitting. They still go by this philosophy. Instead of, <clears throat> if you're using binaural, so here's somebody wearing two hearing aids, and he or she is having omnidirectional hear microphones on both sides, not very intelligible, okay? <clears throat> binaural directional is what most manufacturers do. So they'll got a, a cardioid directional microphone pattern here and a cardioid directional microphone pattern there. It decreases the audibility for sides and behind. Asymmetrical fitting is what Resound often does. They'll leave omnidirectional on one side and they'll use directionality on the other ear. A different approach, okay? Just a different approach. They call it the asymmetrical directional which, fitting. Which year, which year would you fit the directional? They Maybe just flip the a ear. Either one. They just flip a coin, and that's what they do. Yep. Isn't that weird? And so this the, the ear with the yeah. directional will just be working in directional mode, and they get that from research and vision. They think it's, they say this may be, the middle one may be what, think, what you would think you're supposed to do, but it, in reality, this works better. Oh, okay, whatever. It's just their philosophy, their, different, their point of view. <clears throat> I don't think they switch automatically. They're not switching. I think they're, they're fixed. But again, you know what you should do, Tina? It's a good idea to ask a Resound rep next time one comes through your clinic. Say, hey, uh, tell me about your directionality fitting. My, I remember having an instructor at OTC. He was telling me, you guys have this unique, and the person will, oh, yeah, blah, 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 and they'll tell you all about it. <laughs> That's the neat thing about having the reps come by your clinic because they're always talking to you about stuff, you know, and you can find out the latest and the greatest from them. It's always good. Look at this beam forming. Beam forming. Now this is trying to make a directional mic with more than two doors, with maybe three, maybe four doors. Look at all the ports of entry. 
the hearing aid looks like a like a ding dong gun. I mean, it's gross. What does it look like on, on for the wearer? Yikes. Okay, but apparently, this is what they call second order directionality. It's picking up sound like a beam form. It's really focused in one direction, more so than any directional mic is. So they often call that a, a second order directional mic. You sometimes will see this in handheld devices. Now, if you look at this device really close up, you're going to see something here. You're going to see omnidirectional, directional, and beam forming. You'll see kind of. This is a device that could be put on a table, okay? It could be setting, setting on a little stand on the table. And so when you're in a conference meeting, you can aim this toward the person you want to hear. You might just wear it in your pocket, but it's meant as a device. It's like a directional microphone transmitter. These have had limited success. Most people today are using the remote mic supplied by the manufacturer, and almost all the manufacturers supply this. Almost all digital hearing aids have digital noise reduction, and they use directional mics. Almost all of them do. Whether it's Resound, Starkey, God knows what, they all do. And by the way, how many hearing aid manufacturers are there? There's about seven or eight, okay? You're going to have Oticon, Bernafon, Unitron. They like the ons, ons. <laughs> okay, Bernafon, Unitron, Oticon, Starkey, Resound. Uh, what else is there? You know, Beltone, uh, but Beltone's now owned by Resound. Widex, okay? So you've got these various manufacturers out there. They're highly competitive. They all offer digital noise reduction. They all offer directional mics. They all offer automatic directionality, adaptive directionality. So their programs are becoming whoppingly comprehensive, just amazingly full of bells and whistles. And you can hardly keep up on, the, on what's happening every six months because every six months, there's a new release of a new product that's bigger and better than the prior year's product. It's had, hearing aid companies are cranking out product like you wouldn't believe. And every six months, a rep comes to your office and upgrades your fitting software so that it matches the needs of fitting the latest new hearing aid. When you talk about Oticon, they have a hearing aid product called Open, O-P-N. Open, they call it the Open hearing aid. Well, the Open hearing aid doesn't use directionality anymore. Supposedly, the open hearing aid is so intelligent, and the hearing aids are talking to each other, and they're balancing the listening situation for all kinds of listening complex, blah, blah, blah. You'd think the thing woke you up and made coffee for you in the morning. So it's remarkable to hear, you know, what we can do in school is to give you the spinal cords and we can give you like the, the underlying bases and, and the, the colors and the landscape of what's going on. But then it's up to you as a clinician to keep up to date by mapping what you've learned at OTC and putting that onto the new product so that when the person comes in describing the new product, your mind is going click, 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 okay, ding, 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 this is how it fits, okay, I can put the hearing aid in this category, he's talking about the adaptive directionality, the automatic directionality, oh yeah, the polar plots, blah, blah, you can use the information that you've learned here so that you can learn from the reps about their new product, essentially, but it's impossible for any hearing aid program to keep up with the latest of exact wrinkles of all the new, the new releases from seven or eight manufacturers that come out several times a year. So, but it's interesting that way. If we take a look at where our notes are taking us, because we're just about all done here, if I get out of this particular thing here and go back into the notes, we'll see what we can, uh, what other lies we can tell you. So here, this, I would put a star by this, for normal hearing to understand about half of speech, it's gotta be about equal in intensity to the noise, and I would write down zero signal to noise ratio. 
for sensory neural to understand, it's got to be about 5 dB more intense. So that's like a plus 5 signal to noise ratio. D mics try to provide this increase, but you and I know that in real life, it, the number of improvement actually comes closer to 2 or maybe 3 dB improvement. Okay, That still isn't bad. It's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. And don't worry about this stuff so much. This is about that weighting again. Don't worry about that so much. I always say you can simply take the arithmetic average of the DIs at 5, 1, 2, and 4, add them up, and you'll get the same thing. Anyway, this is Killian's little uh, exaggeration thing where he says up to 10% improvement can, can result for each, in, for each uh, decibel that you've increased the signal to noise ratio. And I say, even if the improvement is 5%, you're still pretty good. And then here's that table that you could see with your parent teachers association, okay, PTA. That's just dealing with this particular slide that you saw over here, I think. Where is that puppy? Huh, can't find it. Flipping around, flipping around, it'll give you a seizure by the time you're done looking at it. Anyway, that just deals with that little table that I was showing you earlier regarding um, the, 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 the signal-to-noise ratio required by the hearing impaired to understand things better. And you remember that that got worse and worse. Here it is. I finally found the thing. There, the lost slide. So we're simply talking about that slide when you are over here. Okay, some further points, directionality in BTEs is quite similar to directionality in ITEs. Venting tends to reduce directionality because lows escape without being reduced by the D-mic. Here's something of interest. You've got to know, one out of every 10 D-mics is defective coming out of the factory. <laughs> and so, like I said to you last week, when we were talking about directionality, when you get directionality and, and you've programmed the hearing aids, I would literally take the hearing aid and I would be listening with your static clips, listening to the hearing aid, and I would be talking and I would be turning the hearing aid. And notice if you hear any difference in the loudness of your voice. Hopefully the loudness of your voice was when you were talking toward the front of the hearing aid. And hopefully the loudness of your voice got quieter when you were talking to the back of the hearing aid. That's what you want to hear. You want some kind of a wow effect. You want some type of a noticeable difference. Otherwise, have your client wear the hearing aids and have your client stand in one place with his or her head facing in one direction and you walk around the client and talk and ask the client if he or she hears a difference in the loudness of your voice. That's what you want. You really want the basic common sense. Did you, could you notice a difference that way? It's not rocket science. It's never meant to be. Recent developments in directionality, we've covered automatic directionality, adaptive directionality. We've covered beam forming. And now when we come to the close of this session and you're looking at digital noise reduction, revisited, in comparison to D mics, digital noise does not offer objective improvement for speech and noise. Subjective is what it offers, and yet it costs way more than a D mic. Digital noise reduction tends to remove speech cues as well as some of the noise, okay? And basically, how come there's no digital hearing aids using only one channel, using digital noise reduction? And basically, if we work our way down toward the very end of this slide here, we could cover that, and we covered that last week when we are looking at the channels in a digital hearing aid. I think I know where that is in this particular presentation, too. I think I've got it. I think I do. I think I do. Here, uh, uh, here you go. Perfect. Found it. Okay. If you had a one-channel digital hearing aid, okay, one channel, here's your frequency response. I just drew a fictitious frequency response. And if digital noise reduction was kicking in, and what makes digital noise reduction kick in? When the background sound coming into the mic is steady 
in intensity over time, when it doesn't have much amplitude modulation compared to this sound of speech, which does change rapidly in intensity over time. So if the noise coming in or the sound coming into the mic looks like this, the hearing aid goes, oh, got to reduce the gain. So it reduces the gain, and it would just be simply reducing the gain across the whole frequency response. Well, what's the difference between doing that and turning down your volume? Nada. So all speech and noise is reduced. So they use many channels in hearing aids with DNR in each channel so that here the speech sounds that are dropped okay, are happening in smaller areas. Maybe the steady noise sound like this here on the top, maybe that's what's picked up in these particular channels and these and these. So then the gain is reduced in smaller slivers. Instead of the whole hand going down, it's just a sliver going down. So you're removing less of the baby with the bath water, but still any speech in those channels is also reduced. And any speech in these channels, not only is the noise reduced, but so is the speech. And so basically this is less dangerous or less stupid than this, but still it's like, eh, you know what? Directional mics basically do the job that uh, basically this is the final and summary slide. Digital noise reduction gives subjective comfort. Directional gives objective. Have a good read of chapter 9 in the textbook to take this home. And basically, you're going to hear a lot of this particular PowerPoint presentation this morning. But essentially, that about does it for me. If I go to, if I stop here and look at our notes, where have we come? All the way down. Okay? D mics revisited again. They are far cheaper than digital noise reduction, but they provide much more signal-to-noise ratio benefit. I've always said perhaps manufacturers should make D-mics a standard and make omnidirectional an option rather than the other way around. Put your emphasis on the wrong syllable, okay? But basically, this is talking about why digital hearing aids use many channels. And how much does DNR reduce the gain by? Some 5 to 20 dB. And I'll mention this too. In software, you can choose the degree of digital noise reduction you want. Mild digital noise reduction, average digital noise reduction, buku, okay, you can choose it. So when you get out there in your clinical practicums, you are going to see a lot of bells and whistles. And all I can say is that this particular course HEAR 240, I don't know how many fingers, 2 and 40, HEAR 240 is a course that's just meant to give you the building blocks, basically, so that you can formulate your understanding around what the reps are going to be showing you. Because when you get into the manufacturing sector there, and those reps start talking, yikes, they're going to be babbling all kinds of crap. It's always good to slow them down and say, oh, so you mean that your adaptive directionality is doing this? Oh, so you are using automatic direct? Yes. Okay. Show me what happens to your frequency response when the hearing aid goes into program two. Can I see that? And you'll want to notice a change in the frequency, stuff and things. Okay. Basically, do you have any other questions? Are there any questions that come to your mind right now? Good. Cool. What we're going to do next week is finish the course. And it's under the topic called ADRO, Adaptive Dynamic Range Optimization. Yikes. In English, it's a return back to linear processing, but with an added digital twist. You know who sells ADRO? Sam's Club. Hearing Lab Technology, HLT. They deal with a hearing aid from Australia. And they're the only people in the United States who deal with that hearing aid. It actually emerged from cochlear implants. And now it's used in hearing aids. 
sold by Sam's Club, and a lot of you are going to end up working for Sam's Club because they employ a lot of HISs. So anyway, it behooves of us to have an idea of what the heck ADRO is and what it says. Oh, they don't like WDRC. They use linear gain, but they shift between less and more of it. Interesting. So we'll look at that next week. And then we be done. All right? Cool. I'll stop recording, get myself another cup of coffee here, and get ready to teach 110 acoustics, because that's in about an hour from now. All right? Cheers. See you later. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.